The great Rush Limbaugh passed away on February 17, 2021. Through extensive research and love of country, Rush made it a practice to remind his millions of listeners about the true story of Thanksgiving. Now, I'm going to do my best to recreate that. But it's my sincere hope and prayer that every conservative talk show host and commentator in these once United States will do the same. I can think of no better way to honor our nation's founding. I can think of no better way to honor the great Rush Limbaugh, who gave us this priceless history lesson. So inspired by the words of El Rushbo himself, the true story of Thanksgiving, that is today's preamble. This history lesson was inspired by Rush Limbaugh's book, See, I Told You So, Chapter 6, entitled Dead White Guys, or what the history books never told you, the true story of Thanksgiving. It's also derived from George Washington's first Thanksgiving proclamation. For those of you who are recent products of our CRT, DIE, anti-American government-run education system, George Washington was our first and perhaps greatest president. Speaking of GovEd, we have to begin with the left-wing propaganda that has been spewed ever since I was in school. Everybody thinks that we screwed over the Native American Indians and gave them a whole bunch of garbage for land like the island of Manhattan. It's the other way around, folks, in reality. For years, and especially this year, after the America First win at the ballot box, America-hating leftists, activists, and uninformed students at so-called institutions of higher learning have trashed Thanksgiving because they claim it's based off the genocide of indigenous people. That's what they've been taught. And it's 100% garbage. So let's set the record straight as to why our first president, George Washington, first proclaimed it Thanksgiving. The great Rush Limbaugh started off by asking, who was thanking who for what? Most of you were taught that the pilgrims must have been giving thanks to the Native American Indians for saving them. And that's not what the pilgrims are thankful for, as you will come to understand. The story of the pilgrims begins in the early part of the 17th century. The Church of England under King James was persecuting anyone and everyone who didn't recognize its absolute civil and spiritual authority. The first pilgrims were Christian rebels, those who challenged King James' ecclesiastical authority, and those who believed strongly in freedom of worship. Well, they were hunted down. They were imprisoned and sometimes executed for their beliefs in the England of the 1600s. And does anyone see any parallels to what's happening today around the world to anyone who opposes left-wing totalitarian orthodoxy? A group of separatist Christians who didn't want to buy into the Church of England or live under the rule of King James first fled to Holland and established a community there. After 11 years, about 40 of them, having heard about this new world Christopher Columbus had discovered, decided to risk everything and head out for this new land. Forty of them agreed to make a perilous journey to the new world where they knew they would face certain hardships. But the reason they did it was so they could live and worship God according to the dictates of their own beliefs. As President Ronald Reagan once said, quote, I also believe this blessed land was set apart in a very special way, a country created by men and women who came here not in search of gold, but in search of God, end quote. On August 1st, 1620, the Mayflower set sail. It carried a total of 102 passengers, including 40 folks that we know today as pilgrims, led by William Bradford. On the journey, Bradford set up an agreement, a contract that established how they would live once they got there. The contract set forth laws for the new community, irrespective of religious beliefs or political beliefs. Where did this revolutionary and fair ideas come from, expressed in the Mayflower Compact? Well, it came from the Bible. The pilgrims were a devoutly religious people, completely steeped in the lessons of the Old and New Testaments. They looked to the ancient Israelites for inspiration. And because of the biblical precedents set forth in Scripture, they never doubted that their experiment would work. They believed in God. They believed they were in God's hands. Back then, the trek across the Atlantic, folks, it was no pleasure cruise. The journey to the New World in tiny, by today's standards, sailing ships, it was long, it was arduous, and often deadly. You had your sickness, you had your seasickness, it was wet, it was miserable. When the pilgrims landed in New England in November, they found, according to Bradford's detailed journal, a cold, barren, desolate wilderness. There were no friends to greet them, he wrote. There were, there were no houses to shelter them. There were no inns where they could refresh themselves. There was nothing. The sacrifice they made for freedom was just beginning. During that first winter, half the pilgrims, including Bradford's own wife, died of either starvation, sickness, or exposure. 
but they endured that first winter. And when spring finally came, they had by that time met the indigenous people, the Native American Indians. And indeed, the Indians taught the settlers how to plant corn, fish for cod, and skin beavers and other animals for coats. But that wasn't their prosperity. This is key. They did not yet prosper. They were still dependent. They were still confused. They were still in a new place, essentially alone. This is incredibly important to understand because this is where modern American history lessons often end. Thanksgiving is actually explained in some dumb textbooks as a holiday for which the pilgrims gave thanks for the, to the Indians for saving their lives. Now, don't misunderstand. That part of the story did happen. Nobody denies that. But that's not, according to William Bradford's journal, what they ultimately gave thanks for. Here is the part that has been omitted from agenda-driven textbooks in GovEd. To be able to afford traveling to the New World, the pilgrims had to enter into a contract with merchant sponsors because they had no money of their own, right? The merchants in London were making an investment, and as such, the pilgrims agreed that everything they produced would go into a bank, a common store, or common account, and each member of the community was entitled to one common share in this bank. Now, out of this, the merchants would be repaid until the debt was fully paid off. All of the land the pilgrims cleared, all the houses they built belonged to the community. Everything belonged to everybody, and everybody had one share in everything. They were going to distribute it equally. Now, Rush Limbaugh explained that nobody owned anything. It was a, it was a commune. It was the forerunner of the communes we saw in the 60s and 70s out in the People's Republic of California and other parts of the country, and it was complete with organic vegetables. According to some misguided and unwise people, the Pilgrim's contract was considered to be the epitome of fairness, sharing the hardships and the burdens and prosperity. But under this left-wing socialist system, the hardships were plenty, but the prosperity never came. After enduring months and months of hardship, first in the Mayflower and then in the New World, then came the failure of the common account from which everybody got the same share. The Pilgrims soon discovered there was no incentive for anybody to do anything. And as is human nature, some of the pilgrims were a bunch of lazy Democrat socialists and others, the conservatives, with a strong work ethic, busted their rear ends. But it didn't matter because even the people that weren't very industrious got the same as everybody else. Bradford wrote about this socialist system and how it wasn't working. What he and the pilgrims discovered was, quote, that the most creative and industrious people had no incentive to work any harder than anyone else, end quote. Again, it's human nature. In every group of people that you have out there, you've got your self-starters, you've got your hard workers and your industrious people, and you've got your lazy know-nothings. And under this version of equity, the resentment sprang up on both sides. And Bradford wrote about this too, quote, for this community so far as it was, was found to breed much confusion and discontent and retard much employment that would have been to their benefit and comfort. For young men that were most able and fit for labor and service did repine that they should spend their time and strength to work for other men's wives and children without any recompense. That meant, folks, men had to work without any payment. That was the injustice. Why should anyone work for other people when they can't even work for themselves? What's the point? The pilgrims found that people could not be expected to do their best work without an incentive to do so. Consider this. AOC and her socialist squad, Bernie Panders and Joe Biden's socialists, have bought into this fantasy that the reason why socialism has never worked is that nobody's gotten it quite right. So left-wingers dedicate your family's wealth, your future, to an impossible endeavor trying to fix socialism, trying to refine it, perfect it, and reinvent it. The Pilgrims, with more intelligence than Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and the entirety of their backward political party, the Pilgrims decided to scrap socialism permanently because it brought out the worst in human nature. It emphasized laziness. It created resentment. The pilgrims found a pe that a people can't be united under a left-wing collectivist system. Bradford, the new governor of the colony, recognized that socialism was costly and destructive to the success and prosperity of these early Americans. So Bradford tried something different. Bradford assigned a plot of land to each family as their own. He got rid of the whole communist structure and assigned a plot of land to each family to work and manage. And whatever they made, however much they made, it was theirs. 
They could sell it. They could share it. They could keep it, whatever they wanted to do. What really happened is the pilgrims turned loose the power of a free market. The pilgrims unharnessed the power of good old fashioned free enterprise by invoking the undergirding capitalistic principle of private property. Every family was permitted to market their own crops and products as they saw fit. And history, the real history, not the New York Times 1619 BS, the real history records the results. Quote, this had very good success, wrote Bradford, for it made all hands industrious in no time. The pilgrims found they had more food than they, they could eat themselves. Now, this is where it gets really good, folks, if you're under the impression or misconception that so many people have, and they were taught in GovEd. After the pilgrims were blessed with abundance, they set up trading posts and exchanged the goods with the Indians. The profits from those trading posts allowed the pilgrims to pay off their debts to the merchants in London. And the success and prosperity of the Plymouth settlement attracted more Europeans. This came to be known as the Great Puritan Migration. Everybody in Europe wanted a piece of it. And these early Americans, they were thankful. There was no mass slaughtering of Indians. There was no wiping out of the indigenous people in this time period. The Indians were very helpful. Puritan kids had relationships with the children of Native Americans. There was a very cooperative atmosphere. The killings of the Indians, that came much, much later. That injustice has nothing to do with the foundation of Thanksgiving. President George Washington issued the first Thanksgiving Day proclamation in 1789. It read in part, whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor. And whereas both houses of Congress have by their joint committee requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many signal favors of Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity peaceably to establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next, to be devoted by these people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be, that we may then all unite, rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind and care and protection of the people of this country previous to their becoming a nation. My friends, that's the real story of Thanksgiving. The first Thanksgiving was William Bradford in the Plymouth Colony thanking God not the Native Americans, for their blessings. There was nothing wrong with being grateful to the Indians, and our ancestors shared their bounty as the Indians shared their experience and know-how. It was a shining example, example of what we could all do as a people united under God. The true meaning of Thanksgiving that George Washington recognized in his first Thanksgiving proclamation was thanking God for his divine blessings on our people. Those blessings are the rewards we receive when we live up to the very American creed, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Look at what our people can do when we are united in freedom, not under government, but under God. And now you know why our political enemies, the enemies of man, they hate God, and they're doing their best to divide us. We would all do well to remember where our blessings come from, and we should continue this tradition of remembering where Thanksgiving came from, a tradition given us by a man who never forgot the noble blessings of our blessed land. Thank you, Rush Limbaugh. Miss you every day. You know, folks, I thank God for my wonderful wife, my kids, my country, the greatest nation ever. And Americans like you who believe in the truth, The Chris Salcedo Show will never stop fighting for you. The Chris Salcedo Show, for the news you need to know.